to another episode of The Six Sexy. I'm super excited because today I am joined by the beautiful Teshana. She is a powerhouse model, entrepreneur and marketing coordinator. But most importantly, she advocates for mental health and female empowerment on her Instagram page, which I will link in the description box down below. Teshana, welcome. We'll stop with that introduction. <laughs> <laughs> it's like my resume makes me sound way more impressive. Oh no, no. <laughs> Yeah. 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 So how do you like? Because I know 
when you're young and you're upcoming and you're trying to make something of yourself, how do you balance the idea of your kind of success with that negative connotation of hustle? How do you overcome working yourself to the bone but also still like aspiring to, you know, make something in the world yeah. and inspire people? I think um, I definitely spent a large portion of my life doing that, like pushing myself and, yeah. you know, trying to juggle everything. And then I started to look at what was important to me. Um, I was uh, working a job that I was like running myself into the ground and then doing shoots on weekends to get that creativity out of me. Yeah. And it got to a point where I was just like, I'm having more bad days than I'm having good. I need to change something. Yeah. I can't just sit here and not do anything. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. Um, with working like a full-time job, how did you make that transition from like working all the time and shooting on the weekends to, to now having more of like a life that you actually enjoy? It was really hard at first, so um, I worked in a government, like a government job, okay. um, and then I followed my dreams, and then I decided to, well, I didn't decide, sorry, I got the opportunity to run Hendon Studios, which is the largest yeah. independent film studio in Australia, nice. plug there, um, <laughs> and so I was doing that as well as a second job. So I was still like trying to get through mental health issues, because something traumatic had happened to me yeah. maybe six months before I started like really diving myself in. Yeah. But then um, from there, different job, um, and it got to a point where I was just like, no. Like, and then I had to actually go, okay, it's okay to not have to wake up at this time. Like, you know, still make sure you get up early and you have that structure, but mm -hmm. you don't have to run yourself into the ground if it means that in two years' time you'll be so much worse. Like, take time off if you need to. Yeah. You d you're allowed to and you deserve it. Yeah. yeah. So. I really like that advice because I feel like a lot of us think that if we're not producing all the time, then we're somehow worthless. Yeah. And I feel like worthlessness is something that a lot of young people, whether you deal with a physical illness or not, is something that people really struggle with. Um, how do you, like, how do your friends and family support you in not running yourself into the ground and putting yourself first? I'm really privileged that, um, like, the relationship I have with my dad is really, really close, and he's yeah. so supportive and. Um, I had I had a bit of a mental breakdown last year and I actually lived with him for three months because I was just like a mess. Like I was hospitalized um, uh, from a BPD attack, I guess you could say. Um, and then like my family are just, because I'm so open about how I'm feeling, like I explained to them like when um, I was diagnosed with BPD, I was showing them like videos and explaining why I react to things. So it's just really communicating like this is a bad day like please don't be worried like i'm not doing anything but i'm just like today is not my day yeah and then they understand it parents to worry yeah families to worries but um it's about just connecting and just you know it's open. i'm talking adult to adult i think we have this relationship with our parents that's you know they're still the parent but if you talk to them like as adult to adult Absolutely. yeah they yeah. will understand more than you think maybe. yeah i think tend to want to molly over their children because they still see them as a child mm -hmm. and then when you're trying to break through and like you know be your own independent person and deal with your own struggles without needing to lean on them so much it's a real struggle for them because they don't know how to respond to that um so it's about having that support and even i think even with friends to an extent it's difficult on the other end of that whereas they don't know how to react to problems yeah. how have you found friendships with like mental health and and you know, mental illness, for lack of a better word, are your friends supportive? Uh, yeah, I, I surround myself, I'm very selective with who I surround myself with. Yeah. And I, you know, I've lost friends over the years due to mental health issues myself, like I have taken like shitty behaviour, yeah. um, which I can own, and vice versa. Like, we're all individual people, mm -hmm. and I think it's about um, safe space, talking about it, like my friend Danny is incredible, like she's like that, if I mean, I say Danny time, because yeah. like, or like there's, so many friends I've got that like you just have that time where you can I think like not complain about your problems but just go what's what are your thoughts on it yeah because I'm always yeah. looking for advice on, yeah. on people and be in that space with someone and know that no matter what you say they're not going to be judged yeah. because they get it and I think that's something that I definitely struggle with a lot because because my illness is physical is something that a lot of people understand and when you know, like for example, if you know friends have just had a new baby, I will travel two hours across town to go and see them, 
and then I will be screwed for the rest of the day because yeah. I just put myself through that and it's not really something you can explain because to the to the naked eye I'm absolutely fine and it's like it's really hard to explain that you know like, and that's why I talk a lot about spoons in my videos because it's like you've got your limitations yeah. and then once you hit that level of spoons it's like nah I'm done for the day yeah. so I love the, I love the spoon thing I always say like I'm like my spoons are gone yeah like, I've never <laughs> spoons I'm like, I've explained it to my dad before and yeah. it's like like <laughs> Stigma, but he's getting better, That's and he, he was like, um, "Yeah, I want to. Everyone should be using that phrase, so yeah. you know where people are at emotionally." <laughs> yeah, I just think it's a really good, simple analogy. Mm -hmm. Gets to the point. Yeah. So, you know, that's really, really interesting. Um, tell me a little bit about modeling and what that looks like for you, female empowerment. Well, um, I've been doing modeling, so I started off on Tumblr. It's a nice yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. My face before that. Yeah, yes. This is showing our age now. <laughs> Yeah, there was Tumblr when Tumblr was good, and then now with all the censorship, it's like shit. <laughs> anyway, so I started on Tumblr um, doing like fun photo shoots with someone local. Yeah. Um, and then from there, I sort of just met people in the industry, like ha anyone who's wanting to do modeling. If you are blessed with good hair, like from a hairdresser point of view, I have hair. <laughs> so much amazing. Um, hair modeling, like hair competitions, mm -hmm. like all of those sort of things. I look yeah. like. They're also a way, a therapy for me because I meet the most incredible people, like interesting, and then slowly from there, I, you know, you know people, and then from there you end up shooting for like a big company, and your face is everywhere, and you're like, oh my god. <laughs> and before I before I started talking to Tashana, because believe it or not, this is the first time that we're meeting today, but I feel like she is a kindred spirit, and I feel like we've known each other for a very long time, thanks to the internet. Um, but before I started like kind of chatting with Tayshaun on a regular basis, I actually saw her in, um, it was Graham's campaign, yeah. wasn't it? Yes. And, um, but she was brunette back then. I was, I went, so I went brunette, uh, sorry, I went blonde for L'Oreal Colour Trophy, mm -hmm. um, like I reckon it was two weeks later or a little bit, I just went through breakup too, so I was yeah. like, it's either shave it or go blonde. Yeah, yeah I love it. I'm, I'm so glad it. she went blonde. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, yes, so I was brunette for that. Um, that was so much fun. That was such a good experience. Um, it was the first shoot I did uh, commercially that was all women as well. So like mm -hmm. everyone on the job, like a juice photographer, everyone mm -hmm. was yeah was female. And um, I'm all about quality, but it was just the energy was just it was like it took us a while to notice. We're like, oh, wow, like mm -hmm. <laughs> we're all just like that. Yeah, yeah that's so amazing. I think that you know that the modeling industry has such a bad rap for. Mm -hmm sexism and it, you know, uh, not body positive movements and making women feel like they're inadequate, but I think modeling is so much more different now, yeah. especially here in Australia, like, we have the option to be, like, the station and I are both independent, are you, are you registered with an agent? No, 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 I've never been out of a, a managed master. Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> and I think that's what's so beautiful about modeling in 2020 is that you have that kind of freedom to do that, because I remember my first experience with modeling was a negative one, I kind of... I saw women of the same age as me kind of go that way mm -hmm. purely because of the way they looked mm -hmm. and um, I was seeing kind of the trend with that, like tall, um, looked a specific way, had a specific, you know, had specific features and I kind of wanted to break away from that kind of market and go a little bit niche mm -hmm. and that's when I found that, because like I, you know, tried to apply for quite a few big modelling agencies and I was told, well, look at the walls, look what's on our walls, mm -hmm. you know, that and you're very exotic and oh, that word like, that that yeah. <laughs> that that like pisses me off because it's just like your type casts you into a specific box that you can never get out of. It also tells you that you're not the default. I mm -hmm. hate that that's like exotic is like you don't yeah. 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 How do you how do you as a model like because obviously I mean you have do have very like girl next door features mm -hmm. but I'm sensing a lot of like Russian as well. Yeah. How do you break out of that stigma of I'm not just the blonde girl next door, I have a lot more to offer? Well I so I guess originally when I started modeling what I found was I had dark hair and mm -hmm. tattoos. Nice. So I was automatically getting put in that sexy suicide girl mm -hmm. sort of vibe which was um, I think it's beautiful modeling but it wasn't what I was looking to get into or yeah. put the typecasting to. So I've been quite lucky with that, that um, 
I just style a lot of my photo shoots I've done that are my favorites ones I've styled myself mm -hmm. so I've formed like I've formed my identity and that's what's so important about you know being able to manage yourself is there are certain limitations when you are with an agency like I can't talk about like personal brand is huge Absolutely. so talking about vibrators or talking about this or that mm -hmm. or that anything taboo mm -hmm. your agency has some form of control of Absolutely. Um, yeah. so and I have I have this girl can't be tanked. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's, it's really difficult, I think, in any industry where, you know, the agency that represents you or the business that you work for basically has personal censorship over your mouth <laughs> what, and your opinion and what you put online. And I just don't agree with that because, you know, there are so many different aspects to a human being and it's like if you can't express who you are outside of, you know, your work or your business or whatever, I think it can really harm a person's yeah. personality and self-esteem and you're only just one aspect of yourself and I just I think it's so much more beautiful when you allow a person to just be who they want to be uninhibited and just you know a true self yeah, like exactly being their truth and I think that's really important when it comes to work as well so my, my family always say to me like they don't see all my photos on social media because like I, unless like they're interested they can um, yeah. I've got no, I have no shame but um, there's people that say oh but do you worry about getting jobs do you worry about this or you know like if you're you know you can easily be googled and they're going to see that you wrote this or whatever yeah. it's like well I frankly don't want to work for a business who is going to not be okay with that absolutely and won't accept you who yeah. you are yeah. yeah to just go back on what you said about putting your phone away because this is something that I really struggle with in my day to day life and I've actually I've got an app on my phone that tells you what your um, digital well-being is basically tells you how many hours you've spent on the phone oh. uh, it's, it's bad <laughs> it's bad and like some days when I'm at home studying for five hours yeah I'll be studying for five hours but I would have spent maybe three of those hours on my phone as well Scrolling. and it's just so unhealthy and I'm, like by the end of the day I have the worst anxiety and I was putting two and two together and I was realizing that when I go for a walk on the beach if I was looking at my phone the whole time my anxiety would go down no matter how much I exercise the minute I put that phone away and I just focused on my walk anxiety was gone yeah how do you deal with that you can tell when I'm like not in a good place based around my social media uh, and like how much I use it and things like that like when I'm in a good place I'm like yeah I want to like post photos yeah. and I want to do this and share my life with people yeah. but I tend to when I'm not in a good place I withdraw um but also it's like keeping those healthy boundaries so like if you know sometimes I've had moments in my life where a text message could be a real like life or death situation like your phone can be a bringer of anxiety or a bring or um can help with anxiety so yeah. it's just about using your phone healthily and just about and also like unfollow the people that you don't want to see mm. do not like that is like some sort of masochism like yeah. people can wait like i um, just because you can be always contacted does yeah. not mean that you want to be contacted all the time. absolutely yeah well that your time isn't valuable yeah, exactly like how many hours do we spend and then i sit there on my phone scrolling through instagram the whole time my inner self is like you should be doing this you should
me, it takes months and months and months before I finally tell someone, even if it's a friend, that, hey, look, I'm sick, and this is, my, this is what's wrong with me, I go to hospital, and obviously it's really hard for people to get that, but how do you navigate that with mental health? Oh, I'm terrible. I'm like, I'm one of those, o- like, oversharers, so, like, and I need to make, like, try and make a funny cup of humour, because there's, like, my certain behaviours um, based around certain childhood traumas, things mm-hmm. like that, like, you've got to know something's up, so I may as well just like, well, yeah. whether or not that's a good thing is, yeah. you know, because then you tend to, um, to, like, if you put all your cards on the table, like, again, someone's, like, going to get a preconceived idea of you. So it is, a, it's hard to, to, like, to share, like, try to work out how much you should share, um, and how much you should talk about it, like, you know, that sort of thing, but with navigating relationships, my like borderline personality disorder is something that is heavily affected with relationships. So um, I'm still navigating that myself, but I'm still growing. Like I'm, I have said, I'm a serial monogamist. Um, I've had long term relationships um, since I started dating at like fourteen, yeah. um, and so I just try and pick the right people, I guess, as well as like you want to surround yourself with positivity. You want to surround yourself with people who are gonna you know, build you up, and that's in every relationship aspect. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. How do you have like a like a three day rule or a six day rule as to when you have that conversation with the person, or do you just gauge it based on like their personality and how well they will take it? Because there are certain people in life where you will tell them something about yourself, and you can just you can feel them retract. Yeah. You can feel them close down, and no one wants to be made to feel like they are there's something wrong with them or they're inferior just because they have an illness of any description. So, yeah, I guess, like, for me, it's really important in, you know, deciding when and who I can trust. And I was just wondering how that works for you. That is, like, trust is a big one for me as well is um, my trust is in I will shit tell anyone my story, I will share whatever, but it's the trust of them using that mm-hmm. and understanding it mm-hmm. instead of judging it. Yeah. Um, and to be honest, if someone's going to judge it, like I don't have time for them. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm so I, I sound a lot meaner than I actually am, but like no, not at all. Life, no. life is busy and complicated, mm. and I'm not going to try and surround myself with people who mm. are gonna make me anxious more yeah. than I should. Like it's like in a relationship, in friendships, like yeah. it should be about feeling good being around that person. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think. Look, I think we're getting to an age when I'm in my late twenties, and we're getting to an age where your circle does get smaller it's and scary. life gets bigger. Yeah, it's, I really don't like using the word late twenties. I'm still, I'm still dangling on the mid twenties, but I mean, let's let's be honest. Yeah. I'm just looking back at my like early twenties, like at, like all the things that are no longer around that we can do. Like, well, it's just like and the way technology is going. Mm. Like, I would not do high school again mm. if I mean with tech, the technology now. It's like, frightening. Yeah. <laughs> and look, I do think that it's changing and it's people like you, it's people um, who have spoken openly about the two movement, uh, racism, LGBTQI, um, everything like that, where slowly, like, it's being normalised slowly, mm-hmm. that, like, I'm looking forward to that generation mm-hmm. that hopefully I will see, mm-hmm. where it's, like, laughable, at the, yeah. like, they're like, you're, like, you're... Your generation did that. Yeah, like, absolutely. Yeah. And it'll be, it won't be a stigma to have problems in life. You know, it'll just be another part of everyday life. Because I think that's something most people don't get is when they see women and they see powerful women, it's really ir- irreconcilable the idea of someone that suffers and someone that's also really successful. And I think that's, it's really hard to like, you know, be a really powerful, strong woman, but also be vulnerable and be like, actually, I'm in pain or I'm sick or, yeah. you know, there's something wrong with me. Definitely. I think um, with any gender, um, with any any gender that you identify with, there are certain society pressures on how you should behave. Yeah. Um, and I really do feel for the trans community as well because there's still, you know, that male, female, mm-hmm. all of that, like, there's so many other broader things that we need to fix that I still can't believe we're talking about. Mm-hmm. Like, women can do this too. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, we can. Like, we know, and we need to move forward now. Yeah. The groups have been going on for so long as, mm-hmm. like, you know, call it a women's circle. You yeah. call it a, 
um, networking breakfast for women in a certain industry. Like there have been like the way when women gather together, it's like damn near magical. Like it's serious shit can get done. Like um, so that's what I love celebrating. It's not so much it's ha having a safe space for yeah. women or um, LGBTQR anyone who it generally doesn't feel safe all the time. Like, that's a huge one. Like, I always say to people, well, specifically men, I'm like, you'll never understand what it's like to walk in a room and be like, most people could probably kill me if they tried right now. That's right. Like, yeah. men don't generally yeah. understand yeah. that feeling. Or walking home with your keys between yeah. your knuckles to your car, yes. bracing yourself. Yeah. yeah. Or, or even, like, I was at um, Fringe the other night, mm -hmm. and both my friend and I commented on separate occasions about how we dressed specifically because it was Saturday night. Mm -hmm. It was like, we didn't. We had to walk certain places, so we mm. didn't want to be too noticeable. Mm. And like they're like prep, like we prep. you're prepping yourself. <laughs> yeah, you're, right. you're prepping yourself for yeah. the worst. Yeah. Like, and it's so sad because I feel like a lot of way that we express ourselves as artists is through our clothes and our makeup and you know how we dress and not being able to do that to the full extent because you're afraid of the consequences of that. It's just like this is still happening in 2020. Exactly. And look, I think things are changing and we're getting there and it's about putting out content like this and having that conversation like yeah. sharing um, your experiences especially with the men in your life like uh, my friend's partner when we talk about the prep thing he had no idea and now like he is so hyper aware of it yeah, that's <laughs> yeah so it's just having that honest conversation not being afraid yeah. to do that yeah. thank you so much for being a part of the channel i just had one last question for you and that was basically top three tips for getting through a hard day top three tips are eat even if it's not healthy just like just eat something um I like that. the second one is breathe i know it's basic but like mm -hmm. just being conscious of your breath mm -hmm. as well as nighttime guided meditation um jason stevenson on youtube is amazing like i honestly fall asleep to his sweet voice every night like, <laughs> is it like asmr or is it it's like that? like it's i call it adult storybooks like they're like oh, they'll visualize the forest and your first spirit animal comes in and you know and it's so it's like being a kid listening to and then i'm out like a lot that's amazing so what's it what's the name jason, jason stevenson and I'll, I'll link it in the descri description box down below um yeah that's amazing thank you so thank much you. for all your tips and thank you for thank you for having me and for snacks no we didn't eat enough of it but i'm sure we will oh. once the camera is on oh. we're only gonna Super and be